Good evening to Europe. Uh, good morning to the US and good night to Asia. <laughs> Never mind where you are connected from. <laughs> this is Max speaking. So now I started uh, sharing um, my screen. Um, again, welcome to this uh, Medicaid 3D new webinar. Uh, we want to do some hands-on planning now. Um, my name is, is Max, and this is how you can, can call me. I also went by uh, your, your names, not your surnames. Um, I want to first give a short introduction into the program, and then you will open the program and we will plan a case uh, together. So preoperative planning with uh, the software tool Medicaid 3D Me uh, works on X-rays, MRIs, CTs, and cone beam CTs. Once open the software and load it in, for example, an X-ray, you will see a selection of modules. For X-rays, we offer six modules. There is a, a module called deformity correction for osteotomies in 2D, DFOs, HDOs. There is a module called expert TKA, quick TKA, and a templating module. They are all concerned with arthroplasty. So we have a workflow to measure the long leg axis and um, then insert an implant, obviously plan the resection, plan the resection heights and do the templating. Additionally to that, we also have what we call patellofemoral measurements. So measurements to assess the patellofemoral joint to assign a instability score to this pat patella. Uh, and then to deduct out of this measurement a risk of relaxation of the patella. So uh, if you commonly use such scores because you're dealing a lot with uh, instable patella, then uh, uh, you might uh, well uh, use these uh, measurements to assess the stability and to assess future, uh, the risk for future uh, luxations. In 3D, this uh, doesn't look much different. Uh, there is only a 3D module, 3D printing, 3D segmentation for mixed reality export and for uh, 3D printing export. Um, additionally, a module. Um, as you can see, our program generates a 3D model out of an axial CT slice. So this is what you get just having performed an ordinary CT scan with the axial um, image. So you see, we have the slice views, we have the sagittal, frontal and axial slice view. And out of the Axial CT dataset, we generate all these, the other slice views and our 3D model. Of course, for 3D, we care more about the other um, stuff besides the long leg axis. We have torsion and we have tibial slope, as well as, as of course, all the other um, axial measurements for uh, the patellofemoral joint and its stability. So uh, this would be planning on a torsional profile CT where we can do an HDO DFO, but uh, I presume it's uh, rather the more sophisticated, more complex surgeries which want to be planned by such uh, a, uh, a model, which is, for example, the uh, derotation. Uh, so single cut or single incision. Um, 
osteotomy planning uh, where I can apply a correction angle and apply some inclination to this angle. Um, so this is the osteotomy part. And then we got a third part. This is the arthroplasty part uh, where we are getting um, from, let's say, ordinary 2D templating combined with uh, a cone beam CT scan from the knee to a uh, what we call hybrid planning. And uh, so we can generate a matching between the knee on the x-ray and the knee on the cone beam CT scan. And we can plan the resection heights on the weight bearing AP long leg and the rotation of the implants and their sizes on the cone beam CT. These are three of the use cases uh, which can be done with our planning. I've seen that you have uh, many, many different uh, backgrounds um, and so we are getting already some questions. Um, um, the protocol concerning the protocol, Bruno, we are very, very flexible. So on here, we have a very nice 3D model. Um, if you have a slice thickness of less than 1.5 millimeters, you will have such a nice 3D model. If you say, oh, well, it's a very young patient, I cannot apply so much radiation, then just decrease. And the beauty of your 3D model decreases a bit, but uh, you still get quite an okay 3D model. I will show you around this a bit with the DICOM information. Uh, where all the specs are defined. So here they used 1.2 millimeter slice thickness. And you see that this leads to a really beautiful 3D model where I can see everything I want to see. And uh, on here, we even have a very nice um, uh, soft tissue contrast. So just by changing my Hounsfield units, I can see the patella tendon, I can see other ligaments around the knee. So I can strip my patient off to the heart bone or I can dress it up, dress her up again in this case um, with all the ligaments and, and the skin. Um, yeah, as I said, you're all from very different uh, backgrounds. Um, I believe not everybody is a medical doctor. Uh, who, who is joining uh, this meeting. Um, if you have any questions also concerning the um, technology which is behind, then uh, feel free to um, just uh, yeah, uh, give, give me a call uh, or, or, or um, pose any kind of questions in, in our chat. And I've seen there is another question from Anton. Um, Anton, do you want to go ahead? I'll just uh, promote the new attendees to be able to participate in the discussion. Is there still a question, Anton, or have I answered it already? So if I've answered it already, then I would um, now ask you to look on the desktop for the application called Medicaid 3D Knee. And uh, then you see a surface like that and uh, you have a folder pre-selected and this one we want to change first because the program shows us every DICOM study which is inside this folder 
So we would be going to search and then to the demo images knee folder on your um, on your desktop. So on your desktop, you find a folder which is called set. So if you navigate to the desktop and then you have uh, 3D images, 3D knee, and uh, from then on, you can go to um, the single cut folder. Let me know if you can all find this. I'm not on a remote desktop, so my folder structure looks a bit different, but you should be able to find a, a demo images um, hard uh, drive with uh, um, a folder demo images knee single cut, you can enter this folder. What will appear is a DICOM study from Anderson Larry P. Um, this is the CT I was using for the planning I showed you. And you can simply click on him and with another left click with a mouse, load in your CT data set. Once uploaded, the status bar will close and the CT data set will appear among the loaded images. We can then start the planning and we should be seeing something like that. The software automatically um, removes the CT table and tries to denoise some things. Um, so far we got, and uh, what's next is um, that um, we go into the submodule deformity correction from the main menu into deformity correction. And we will perform the um, torsional measurements. To give you already a hint, uh, so this patient, uh, as uh, we announced already, has a kneecap which is lateralized by a apparently very high TTTG. So the distance from the trochlear groove to the um, patella tendon point of attachment, the tibial tubercle is quite high. And so this was a classic case of uh, patella instability. And so, um, Speaking about instable kneecaps, uh, we have uh, a couple of treatment options. Uh, we have trochleoplasties, we have uh, tubercle transfers and uh, MPFL reconstructions, as well as what is getting more and more common, torsional corrections. Uh, so single cut osteotomies, where a surgeon would just cut through the femur turn it around or turn the femur around to um, come uh, just nicely beneath the, the patella. Uh, so with our software, we want to enable surgeons to find out the best way of treatment. And we want to basically come from the long leg axis and the torsional deformity to TTTG and then to the shape of the trochlea and further to the ligaments. Uh, because if there is no valgus and no torsional deformity, then obviously the patella cannot stem from, from such deformities. Uh, the patella could then stem from a lateralized tibial tubercle, maybe. Uh, so I, I would just uh, do a tubercle transfer and get it more to the medial side. But it can also be 
to due to ligamentous insufficiencies if I don't even have a pathological TTTG. And by planning like that, we want to find out where does the instable kneecap really, really come from. And um, so this is why we first go into deformity, deformity correction and start uh, with uh, our long leg axis measurements and the torsional measurements. For every function, you have a tutorial video which shows up in full screen. And I will just go through all of the functions, starting with hip joint center. I can draw this in 2 and 3D. I will swap over to 2D. Now I have several means of navigating. If I see these three, um, yeah, kind of uh, three pages in a row uh, on my cursor, I'm in fast scrolling mode. So when I press the left mouse button, I can quickly go through my slices. I can just like in a PEX viewer, scroll with my mouse wheel rather um, slowly. And I can, by clicking on the right mouse button, change my focus points. Oh. This is how I navigate through the software. And now we are to measure up the hip joint center with three clicks. We go to the edges and then define with a third click the, the hip joint center. The same we do in the sagittal view plane two clicks to the edges and the last click. With the last click, we exit the function, we get a green tick next to the function. And this is where we can delete the function as well. If we are stuck in the middle, then do not hesitate and uh, just reset one step or restart the whole element. So, Never, uh, never mind. There is always a way to to get back or to just make one step uh, to just undo one step. For the tip of the trochanter, we simply scroll through our slices best in a fast manner by holding down the left mouse button and going up and down with the mouse. The next is the knee base on the femur. Um, this as well is the same for 2D planning as it is for 3D planning. And uh, we uh, take the bicondular line or the condylar tangent on the distal femur and the epicondyles as medial and lateral edges. For the sagittal view, we define a distal femoral shaft and on the perpendicular line, we put this one to the most distal point of the femoral shaft. I want to remind you for every function, there is a tutorial video which shows up in full screen if you forgot how to perform this measurement. Um, any questions at that point already from your side? Are you getting on well or you facing any, any troubles? Just chime in if you do so. So we keep going with the knee base on the tibia. Uh, We'll find the tibial plateau and define medial and lateral edge. And uh, on here, we do the same 
we look for the tibial plateau and define anterior and posterior edge. For the ankle joint base, we take uh, with two with the two mouse buttons held, we can drag up here our ankle joint and uh, zoom in a bit. Zooming is done by pressing the control button and spinning the mouse wheel. We grab the talus shoulders and define via the talus shoulders medial and lateral edge. Uh, there is another question from Bruno. Can you plan a 3D hip or a knee from only the plain X-ray or do you always need a CT or MRI as well? So we can plan on basically any image material. The um, company has a 3D knee, which is compatible with all image um, data, X-ray, CT, MRI. The hip 3D is only 3D, so CT and MRI, but we have uh, 2D planning solutions as well. So we have the Medicaid Classic, which contains everything which is 2D, hip, arthroplasty, joint preservation, knee, arthroplasty, bicondylar, unicondylar, um, also revision and two, two more endoprosthetics. And um, of course, uh, also the part uh, joint preserving osteotomies, single double level, everything from X-ray to CT or MRI. Um, and another question, is there a specific CT protocol? Um, there isn't really, because we are very flexible, but if you go, for a slice thickness of over 2.5 millimeters, then you will have a very bad um, 3D model. Uh, it won't look nice. And the next thing is that CT protocol really depends on what you want to do. So um, for example, this uh, protocol, uh, it doesn't really contain a lot of shaft. If I want to perform a derotational osteotomy, I should be aware that it's very important that I grab the shaft very well. So I need, I really need to have an exact shaft because if I don't have an exact shaft, the whole planning will be flawed because I plan on my shaft, how I derotate my patient. Oh, I uh, do uh, an intramedullary nail. Uh, I, I perform um, intramedullary uh, alignment with a long nail. And uh, for the planning, of course, I need to see the shaft that I, I'm really sure what I do, uh, that uh, this doesn't go a wrong way because I have too little shaft to measure it up. So this is quite important. For a total knee arthroplasty, completely different. If you are only interested in a size on, on 3D data, uh, you, you only need the knee, uh, something, some, something like this section, because then you can easily define the rotation of the implants with a flexion axis and extension axis. You see the tibial tubercle, you see the whole of the patella. This would be more than sufficient for um, prosthesis templating. Uh, and uh, like if you go for 2D templating, then the gold standard as 
every manufacturer still puts it is the weight bearing long leg AP view. Uh, the one which I've got, for example, here. So a weight bearing status with a calibration sphere for the templating can also be some sort of um, a scale or a magnification factor, anything to do calibration. And um, a nice view in AP, patella facing the front side and having about a one third overlap of the fibula by the tibia. So one third from the tibi from the fibula head should be covered by the tibia. This is um, some kind of uh, what I would uh, recommend. I hope uh, I could answer your question by saying that um, we are pretty flexible and we adopt protocols um, together with uh, the planning surgeons and their the radiologists to find a good and, and valid way for them to do planning. Um, as you see, we performed already all uh, mechanical axis measurements. Now we want to do the anatomical axis for femur and tibia as well. So here I have the option either to go by um, for distal and for proximal clicks in the frontal and in the sagittal view plane. where I get this shaft, or it works for both femoral and tibial shaft. I change here in settings from four points to two circles. I move with the right mouse button, my focus to the um, proximal tibial shaft, and I define a best fit circle. First point here for the shaft. Now I move my focus downwards and I put the next circle. This is how we define the shaft. Since we performed now all measurements required for showing the preoperative knee dimensions, we can simply click on here and all preoperative knee dimensions will appear in their AP, ML, and 3D values. So um, we define many values here. We have a various valgus value, and they all um, are displayed in the fashion of ML, AP, and, and 3D. And uh, so we can already uh, do a first assessment of where the deformity lies. I um, mean, I have here a physiological. Um, value for my lateral proximal femur angle and uh, pathological values for my um, medial proximal tibial angle and for my lateral distal femur angle. So you see, we use all the nomenclature from draw Paley. So this is basically where we base our planning on uh, the expressions um, conceived by Draw Paley, just to, to let you know. Um, what second is the torsional deformity um, works after two um, ways, more or less, for each. I'll be using only Weidelich here. So what I do is I define for the torsion of the femur, for its internal torsion, I define a proximal line, which I do by fitting an ellipsis into the, tro into the greater trochanter. So this is my proximal line, a proximal um, line for measuring the torsion. I can adjust this, I can edit this. 
And then I can jump to the corn dials with next step to define the distal line of my femoral torsion. And you see it appearing already. So uh, now it's still, still wobbling around here. So as long as I haven't put the line to the condyles, now I have, and I get a bit more than 40 degrees of an internal femoral torsion, which is far off the uh, normal range. The same we do for the tibia. We can either scroll through the slices or navigate in the 3D model with the right mouse button. We simply drag our focus anywhere we have bony structures. So I can go to the tibial plateau and define a tangent to the posterior condyles of the tibial plateau. Afterwards, I go down with my focus to the malleoli. I look for a slice where I can see um, nicely fibula and tibia. And I define the transmalleolar axis with two ellipses into the medial and lateral malleolus. And I get the dashed line for a distal reference line of the tibial torsion. Our tibial torsion here, 34 degrees. And uh, as a third point next to the long leg axis and the torsional deformities of, of the patient, it is the um, lateralization of the patella by its point of attachment on the tibial tubercle. So we will just go back to the, to the main menu. So we go back here from the submodule selection to the main menu, go to patellofemoral measurements and click on TTTG here. You see the condylar tangent on the femoral condyles has been already recorded and the software always remembers lines which had been put previously because we don't wanna do measurements twice because of ease of use and because that we do not run into unvalid measurements. So, so we can start grabbing our trochlear groove, maybe around here. And secondly, we scroll down to find the tibial tubercle. I think I get it somewhere here, but I leave this up to the surgeons because they know better than I do. <laughs> so maybe around here. And of course also the value TTTG is um, slightly increased. So um, from science, um, I think we, we respect 16 millimeters to be the upper edge of a TTTG distance. I don't know how your approach is concerning that, but uh, I mean, we, we commonly regard 16 millimeters as starting to be pathological. So let's keep this in mind. We have three factors. We have the long leg axis, we have the torsion, and we have the TTTG. From looking at it directly, I would not know what to do because I have a slightly increased TTTG. I have a, yeah, well, not massively increased torsion, but an increased torsion. So maybe it's uh, the trochlea which doesn't uh, keep my kneecap in, in place. So I have 
measurements to assess this if you want. So we have a lateral trochlear inclination. And uh, this is what we measure between the posterior condyles and this lateral angle here. And uh, having a look with almost 19 degrees, this is quite a nice bony stabilization factor for my patella. So I reckon I shouldn't worry too much about that. So also just by looking at it um, with a double click, you get into this mode of full screen for a slice view. And with a double click, you get back again to four, um, four rectangles showing the slice views and the 3D view. Um, so just by simply looking at it, I can see, oh, well, the patella appears to be quite nicely in my trochlear groove. So what I can do now is I want to perform a surgery. So we go back to the main menu, deformity correction, and change from the tap deformity correction to osteotomy. So we have here two taps. We change to osteotomy now. Now... Besides the femoral tibial resection for total knee arthroplasty, there is manual cut fragment positioning for trauma cases of a bony fragments, which you want to segment and then put to another place. There is also standard DFO HTO in 2D applied here on a 3D model, because I want to know how does the slope, how does the torsion evolve with my HTO? Or I do not want to create a pathological slope. Or if I do a medial opening wedge HTO, or I do not want to increase my TTTG. If it's a nice TTTG, I, I do not want to mess up patella tracking by doing a HTO. And uh, so... If we were now to perform single cut osteotomy to correct the torsion and maltracking, we can like that simulate how our long leg axis evolves. Uh, so in the first step, I put with my left mouse button a um, cutting plane to the distal femur, for example, or anywhere, anywhere you like. I apply a correction angle for, in this case, maybe 15 degrees. And I see in a live update how values will change. So, for example, here I have a torsion which is too high. So I want to turn the femur to the outside a bit. I apply a correction angle 15 degrees external, so turning towards the outside because it's now pointing inward. I want to make it point more to the outside. So like that, I have an impact, of course, onto my torsion, which changes by 15 degrees, as you had already expected, and also an impact on my lateral distal femur angle. I can now, if I go to the sagittal view plane, also incline my cut. So this cut is coming from the surgical technique of having an intramedullary rod or, or nail cutting through the bone completely and then turning with two, um, whatever you use, I mean, you, you use maybe shanks, um, screws or, or K wires, and then turning on your intramedullary rod, which is basically the femoral shaft, your two pieces, your two bone pieces, um, uh, each other from, from each other, uh, I, I think you got, you got what I mean. Now this cut, which is now 90 degrees onto my femoral shaft axis, can be inclined by a bit to the posterior or anterior side. And I can have a look how this impacts 
my um, values around an E and my various values value. So if I slightly incline to the posterior side by maybe 10 degrees, I see I'm going to the, to the right direction with my um, lateral distal femoral angle. Uh, I'm getting more into the norm values of 87 degrees. Uh, and I can, I can play with these values and see how the torsion is evolving in the meantime, which is obviously getting less because we are now not cutting plane. Oh, we, we, we don't cut like that. Oh, we cut a bit like that and we have an impact onto the long leg axis. Oh, some do planning on a banana. Nowadays we do planning with, with software and this is how this could, could look like. Um, one might also apply a leg extension. So if you want to maybe up to one centimeter, extend the leg here, then you get the uh, change, of course, in leg length and in your preoperative values. Uh, so this is the power of the software. If I want to now all values to update, all post-operative or planning values to update, I can just cut and it will all be recorded on here. Now, let's not only do a distal femoral rotation, let's also do a high tibial rotation. And now, what is the beauty That is that, of course, in this case, TTTG was a bit pathological. And as a surgeon, I want to know, so how will TTTG evolve if I might um, derotate the patient on the high tibia? So I can simulate with a cut on the high tibia, how will my TTTG end up? So if I apply a torsional correction and I want to get into the norm values for MMPTA, I would incline my cut a bit, uh, maybe up to 18 degrees. Well, let's have a look from the side. Oh, like I would cut like that. And now let's all have a look onto our uh, TTTG, we can monitor how this evolves. If we cut our TTTG and all other values as well, which we, we've recorded, updates. And we see for this kind of correction with only 10 degrees of derotation, I can, yeah, by one millimeter, by solely one millimeter, change my distance TTTG. So I medialize only slightly my uh, patella tendon. This is the, the outcome of, of this simulation. And um, coming from here, you can either rule out bony deformities as factors for the instability of this patella, or you can say, yeah, well, yes, it is not an insufficient MPFL. It might as well be an, an insufficient MPFL. But nowadays, science does say tackle the leg axis first before you do MPFL reconstructions. And this is the, yeah, the power which this tool wants to help you with uh, to assess where is where does the instability come from and uh, what can I do to correct uh, this uh, this instable knee uh, because uh, if I see no pathology in the long leg axis and no torsion 
then uh, it, it might be a TTTG. And if it's not even TTTG, uh, then it needs to be ligamentous structures or a bad shape of the trochlear groove. And uh, this is where I believe planning can help a lot in finding the right way for treating your patient. Um, this uh, is, I think, a good um, point to uh, ask for, for questions from, from your side. Um, did you get on well with the CT data set? Because if you did not, then you can load a planning, go into the same folder. I will do this maybe. Yeah, I can do this with the same. And load the planning, go into the same folder called single cut and choose the file which ends with MPL3K and open this one. And then you can play around with it um, with, the, with the finished uh, planning already. Any questions on that stage, at that stage? There is one. There is a difficult question, Anton. Um, uh, he asked, can we use the same protocol that we're currently looking at for TKR? Is it necessary to use anti-rotation rod while scanning to avoid rotation mistakes if a patient knews during scanning? Um, for what I know, um, is that the guy which uh, came up with this measurement, uh, Weidelich and his pal uh, Strecker, they did also um, recommend a stable position for the patient. So uh, they um, gave, with a protocol, they gave... Um, also uh, instructions to position the patient in the CT scanner. Um, I strongly recommend to stabilize the patient um, throughout the scan. It isn't that important in which view it is scanned because we have many options to just define coordinate systems with our 3D planning. So if there was a malpositioning of the patient, I can just correct this by performing a patient-specific uh, coordination uh, by, by um, introducing a patient-specific coordinate system. Um, however, what I cannot do, if the patient in the meantime changed his position, then this is basically the worst case. So if you can assure for a stable position, it's fine. And we don't care so much uh, what this position is like, because we can just turn the patient to AP ML as we want by defining a reference system. Hope uh, I could answer your question like that. Um, if you, and we have still 10 minutes left, want to play around a bit more with the software, why don't maybe apply a DFO HDO? You just um, define with two clicks, a cutting line, point of incision, point of rotation. You can edit these two and you can apply a correction here. And you see again the long leg axis values updating here. So 
um, what I'm doing here is is crap. Excuse myself, um, but uh, just for demonstration purposes, uh, if I do this, of course I'm I mess up my leg completely. And uh, my long leg axis dates up as well as my TTTG dates up. And uh, this is uh, what I want. So I can delete again my, um, my performed surgeries. Uh, you can also go for a resection or just try out the templating. If you go into templating, you can add any kind of implant. For example, Simabiomet Persona. So if you are interested in um, 3D templating, you can get here our implants move into glass view and then we can go for the correct size choose a smaller size here Of course, do this in all in all views. Go through the slices here and adjust the components. And of course, then plan the rotation as a deviation from the condyles or epicondyles or from the Akagi's line as well. So these are the means by which we, we measure rotation deviation of the implants. Same applies to the tibial component, uh, which we can also put as we like. And once we're satisfied, we simply check in our expert TKA in the main menu on the tab visualization. A distance visualization by which we can look whether we have good contact with hard bone, which means a red color and a blue color means that we only lie onto soft tissue. So we need more contact to the bone. So we were to move up our implants a bit. Oh, so. I move this up a bit. You see how distance well is a visualization. I get more and more red here. I'm entering more and more hot bone. Use this also for revision implants because this is where it really counts. Um, for example, use it with, uh, if you like, strike a revision triathlon. Uh, and uh, I'll leave out now the insert and uh, check how this is going with your little shaft you got here or also longer stems. We also have stems in our implant database. So that would be it from my side. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you didn't find it too boring. Um, and uh, I hope uh, I could show you something which we can catch with 3D planning. And the 3D planning is great and it's hopefully the future. Have a very nice evening and uh, hope to hear from you again. Bye.